Hello, everyone, and thank you, Don, for inviting me to come to this conference, as this is my favorite topic. So I'm very excited to talk to all of you about this. So uh, the first uh, uh, thing I wanted to share with you was, was our family history and sa how we, we got into wine. So a lot of you mentioned uh, the link between families and, and winemaking. So we've been making wine for 150 years, and, and, and what that makes you uh, responsible for is long-term thinking and the the the, the raison d'être, the reason why we have we have uh, this uh, this winery is cultivé pour transmettre. Everything we do is to take these vineyards to the next generation, and that's really what we try to do. So if you think of that, it makes actually protecting our vineyards against climate change. It makes this a fighting game, and I think to the point of I think it was Elizabeth who who talked about this. Um, we need to be very, very proactive in adapting these terroirs in order to have them adapt to uh, what, what will happen and to anticipate what is going to happen. So that's really our, our day to day. So this is just a, a word about, about our, our story. Um, so as you see, we started in, in Lafitte in 1868 with my great, 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 great grandfather, Baron James. And then we started developing in Bordeaux with these uh, amazing estates close to home. And my father, who had this, this, uh, this spirit of adventure, went to Chile, um, to Languedoc, to Argentina, with a great project with, with uh, uh, Laura's father. And then we have been to China to develop this incredible winery uh, in Shandong. And more recently, this is actually my uh, era, we have been to Chablis. And if you think that we have now invested in Chablis, this is actually the reasoning of also how do we make uh, a family of estates that looks at the future, where have we gone further north in a region that used until the 50s to be so difficult with frost and hail that it had had a lot of difficulties in, in, um, in, in having regularity of growing and now it's, it's a region that we really believe in for the future. So if we think of our approach, I talked about it, we're very long term. Um, we consider we consider the fact that R and D is is absolutely very important and it needs to be very connected to the ground. It shouldn't be research in labs. It has to be research that happens. Actually, oh, I have the screen here. Uh, it has to be research that happens in the in the um, in the plots and everywhere that we are. And the the fact that we have all these wineries around the world actually allows us to connect knowledge and to learn from one place to the other. Because if you have one rootstocks that w worked in Languedoc, why not use it actually in Pomerol when it's starting to be a little bit drier? So that's really the the real force of having this 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 web of connected knowledge. And then we talked about it. Um, protection to climate change has become a fighting game. And then to the point that a few of you made earlier. Um, when you're in a position of being a winery that is very looked at, we believe that sometimes we need to also put, um, uh, go in the process of certifying ourselves to show that we're not just using our own rules. So that's why all of our French vineyards are now organically certified and that we've gone after the B Corp commitment because we believe that that commitment had also the social aspect in it that uh, showed that we were in, in the process of, of thinking we were more and believing we were more than a company. So now, if we look at, at this is an important map because when, when Harvard and we talked a lot about research and, and science and, and at the end of the day, uh, one very, very important part of our job is observation. It's walking the vineyards, being every day uh, in the vineyards of Lafitte and Giannino. I live across from uh, from the Lafitte Chateau over there and, and I see that it's actually when you're in the vineyard every day that you can adapt. And I think to someone's point that organic farming makes better quality wine, it's also because people spend more time in the vineyard because they have to. And if you look at these two maps, it shows you these these plots were designed by the, the wine growers, uh, the wine, uh, the vigneron um, at the end of the 19th uh, century. And you see how they decided on separating the each line and deciding where they put Merlot, where they put um, uh, where they put the, the the separation and the and the faults in the land. And when you look at this, this is a map we did in 2005 about the subsoils, and you see that the divisions of the land that that were drawn at the time were actually very spot on, and incredible differences in terroir. May it be 
the breaks between sandy soils or, or more gravelly ones may be the limestone zones that they were. So it shows you that only by observing, because at this time it was just observation, you could get uh, things right. Now we look at what we, we want from viticulture. So we talked about all this all day. So the bottom part shows you that, that we're really trying to find a viticulture that favors health and respects the environment. And, and, and what we're working on is, is uh, bio or organic viticulture, biodynamics, and also trials to alternative to copper. Then how do we protect our soils? And then how do we adapt to climate change? Because that's really part of how we adapt to um, adapt our terroir. So we call this an agro-ecosystemic approach. It's quite a pompous name, but it's to show you that it's fun to have cows and to also think about uh, hu um, ar architectural um, thinking uh, in, in the way we think of our, our vineyards. So if you look at this ecosystemic approach, what does it mean? It's a multi-scale approach. It goes from the whole territory to the site, to the vineyard, to the plot. Marco talked about it a little bit. How do you adapt the way you think of a plot? In Poyac, we used to have only one meter row spacement. Now we're looking at doing 120 or even 150 uh, in or meters uh, be between the rows in order to adapt to a more uh, dry environment. How do you look at the row um, height? We actually uh, lowered, uh, uh, heightened the bottom uh, string and lowered the top one to have less um, leaf area to have less evapotranspiration. So that's multi-scale. Then it's multidiscipline, of course. We look at all different uh, approaches and sciences to discover how to work on this and a different approach to how we consider this to be performing. So now if we look at why we're doing all this and why we think this is the right, uh, right way. One important part of, of our story is history. You, you saw it and it's a passion of mine. And one of the things when we decided to restore balance in our landscapes, I said, let's look at the past. And in France, it's quite cool because y if you look online, you have these maps of how the vineyards were in the past. So this is Océan, which is an area of, of, of our uh, Lafitte vineyard. It's across the road, and, and I live in that, in that little village. And this is Les Carruades, which is one of our most qualitative plots of Lafitte. So you see that in the 50s, what do you have? You have an alternative of vines and these bosquets, these kind of uh, little uh, fields, and then some areas that are left with, uh, with, with um, elements that are not vines. And actually, I have a neighbor who lives next to me here who is 94, and he always tells me that he used to grow. He had an area where they would have the cow's pasture, and that where they were all the vignerons of Lafitte were allowed to plant things. So you have this history. Then you look at how this vineyard evolved in the 70s. So you start to see on this plot, more than on the other one, how a lot of these areas were uprooted. Then you look at 2000. It's not just an effect of the contrast of the Xerox. There is a lot less um, 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 a v a diversity of planting. And then you look at what we want to do in 2030. So it's, um, it's coming back to how things were before and actually how did we do that? We looked at the past and we said, look, here there used to not be vineyards. Here this zone is, is not that good to, to plant vines. Let's just plant something else. So let's put water because we can see that the drainage system is bad in that area. So that's really what we've been doing and actually mapping the ideal vineyard for tomorrow. And this is what it looks like with the fact that we're actually going to have to uproot four hectares. So in acres, that is nine hectares, nine, ten acres. We're actually going to have to uproot ten acres of vine to get to this map. So if you think of that, it's a lot. Someone mentioned the cost of uh, land in Poyac. It's, it's a big investment, but it's a short-term loss for very long-term planning ahead and thinking that this vineyard is probably a lot stronger to look at how to uh, protect itself against climate change. So then, if we look at why we're planting these hedges, why we're doing all this, I'm not going to teach you all of this, all of you know. This is good for windbreak, it's good for sha shade, it's soil erosion, you don't get your plot of vine at the bottom of the, of the slope. It's great for wildlife and for um, mycorrhizae and microbiome, which is uh, right now a, a 
thesis that we're financing with Palmer and Leoville Lascaz and Latour on the fact that the connection of the mycorrhiz creates um, a better life for, for the vines. So once again, talking about, about multi-scale, we looked at the different approaches of what we can do, the plot configuration, the plant material, the training system, how we, we use the density, the trellis, and the pruning. On the plot, of course, the cover crops, a variable, variable approaches to cover crop. We used a little bit, like Marco said, normally we do hay uh, to retain uh, water inside. This is in L'Evangile, which is our estate in Pomerol that has the most uh, issues with, uh, with water capturing. So we, we, we are looking at these, these different approaches. And then this is an interesting uh, point to what Elizabeth was talking about. It's how do you anticipate the future? So we actually planted a plot that we called the parcel phare. A uh, phare in French means a uh, uh, lighthouse. And it's, it's the plot of genetic history and of adaptation to climate change. So we actually planted it in a zone of Lafitte, of Lafitte soil that is this very um, uh, qualitative in, in order to see how it, how it would behave. And what did we plant in this plot to uh, anticipate climate change? First, we planted our massal selection. So that means that for four years, we assessed 44 hectares of the oldest vines, mostly vines that were uh, prior to 1956 because there was a big uh, uh, frost in, in Bordeaux in 1956. And we found 91 uh, vines that we thought were beautiful enough that we wanted to keep their, their story for the future. And it was a very interesting process. We would go out with the team in the morning um, at different moments in the year and d decide if these vines were, were good enough. And there was a, a series of, of criteria. And so we planted these in, uh, in this, uh, this plot. And the other things that we put in this, in this um, far plot is climate adaptation. So it's, do we love these grape varietals? Probably not. Do we think they're good for Bordeaux? Probably not. Do we want to be in advance if 15 years down the line we actually realize that this could be a solution? Maybe. So that is why we ended up doing this, uh, this plot that looks at all of these varietals and that also looks at resistant varietals against certain illnesses. Then we looked at rootstocks also. How can we anticipate what rootstocks we can think of for the future? If you think about it, there's 31 rootstocks we could use. There's only six that are used regularly. So is there something to be looking at in that topic? Maybe. And what did we do in Duarte Milon? We did a plot where we planted eight rootstocks um, on a very qualitative area to actually see what would happen and how this will behave. So once again, we love trials. Biodynamics. Once again, we did a trial to um, analyze how to work with biodynamy. Um, Lafitte and Poyac people on the left bank are very scientific. So when I arrived and I said, I want us to do biodynamy, they all looked at me like I was insane. And then, little by little, this was in 2016, we thought of a way to do biodynamy in, 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 in a spirit that, that, that corresponded to, to what Lafitte was. So we did it as a trial. And if you think of it, biodynamics is really more about a uh, uh, holistic approach and thinking of the whole area uh, around the vineyard and, and thinking of the people, thinking of what happens holistically around the vineyard. But you know what? We're there, so we did it in a little bit of a different way. So we did a plot where we did l uh, some um, strips of biodynamy versus organic, just normal organic farming. And it's been five years that we're working on this and we actually have this incredible PhD uh, uh, th thesis going on on this subject that um, is our R&D director is conducting. So it's interesting. And it, it, it may uh, anger some biodynamists to think that we can look at this only scientifically, but we think it's a it's an interesting uh, way to, to think of it. And then we're at a data conference, so I wanted to show you that we, we, we actually um, think that data is, is our gold. We, we think that observation are, and our eyes are really much our gold too, but, but we use data every day. So we use it to see how we've been planting hedges across our estates. We use it to look at cover crops in our vineyards and to look at when to destroy cover crops year after year because now that there's 
uh, more drought, we end up de uh, destroying cover crop at an earlier stage in the season than we used to. As you know, we don't have irrigation, so it has a real impact on what we do. And then simply, uh, we have objectives in terms of, of carbon footprint and of um, the, the usage of, uh, of energy. So we use it every day for electricity consumption. And the fact to lower our electricity consumption and our energy consumption is actually one of the tools that we have um, even for uh, the, the students, uh, the, the, um, the workers have an incentive plan uh, to, uh, in their salaries to lower um, electricity usage. So it's a, um, an approach that, that we look at. And outside our, our vineyards, we look at, at elements uh, like uh, the bottle and, uh, and things like that. So that's the end of it. Of course, I didn't talk too much about humans, but a uh, key element of all this is how you work with a team, how you motivate people, and how you make them believe that if we look at this, we're looking at the future.